All right. Welcome to another episode of Closers Are Losers. Jeremy Miner, co-founder, chairman of Seventh Level, Matt Ryder, business partner, extraordinary and amazing myth man, legend, the CEO, <laughs> all the way down under the Sydney, Australia office. All right. Today, we've got a real treat for you. We've got a real treat for you. I was thinking about this before we got on. I'm like, you know what? Let's, let's do something. Let's do something different. Let's talk. We got to get some more tact. The last couple of times, we haven't really given that much tactical training. And so a lot of times when when companies bring us in to do like what we call sales audits and we kind of see what their gap is, you know, where they're at now compared to where they want to be, what's yep. the problem in the middle. A lot of it is is just like certain words they're saying and word tracks they use or have taught their salespeople, they don't understand are triggering massive sales resistance from the prospect internally. Mm -hmm even from the first 30 seconds of that conversation and that could be on a cold call if, if the company's cold calling prospects it could be on an outbound if they focus on outbound leads where somebody responds to some type of social media ad or seo ad and they're calling back to you know get back with them like they requested information could be on inbound leads that even book on their calendar that they show up at their home or at their business if it's b2b or on zoom it just depends but there's so many things that they're doing initially even in the first 30 seconds that internally trigger the prospect to emotionally shut down What are, you, what are your thoughts? This is going to be a pretty big subject. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's something that everyone needs to learn because there's so many bad habits that people are doing on a day-to-day, week-to-week, call-to-call basis that um, is potentially or definitely losing them sales. <laughs> oh, yeah. They don't even know, right? They're like, I don't know. I get so many objections. Like, I want to think it over. I need to keep doing more research. or I need to keep looking at other companies or vendors. or I need to get more quotes don't understand how even from the very beginning of that conversation that sales process tons of things they were just saying little word tracks and just little things had triggered what, 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 what are some of the most common ones that you hear oh my gosh you have no idea or you want me to give you you want me to give you like two ones okay so let's any any industry i don't care if you sell vacuum cleaners door to door if you sell freaking you know 25 million dollar estates in the bahamas all the way to you selling you know on wall street i mean it doesn't matter yeah. any industry you can name of the f-bomb i always hear the f-bomb i don't mean the f-u-c-k bomb i mean the i'm just following up with you john i'm just following up with you to see where we're <laughs> at right? that's the f-bomb in sales you have to get rid of the two words these two words especially i'm just following up with you in your emails yeah. text voicemails calls i'm just following up with you or i'm just checking in you literally might as well be saying i'm just calling to take your money so i can make a commission because that's how the prospect interprets i'm just following up i'm just checking in and that's because they have heard following up and checking in for decades. In fact, their great, great grandfather heard that back in the <laughs> Silver War. I mean, it's like that old and that been around that it triggers sales resistance right from the get go. Those are just two examples right there. Just following up, just and for those of the, for those people who are new, like the, the, I guess, triggering sales resistance. What do you mean when you say that specifically? So when I, when I talk about triggering sales resistance, so just human behavior 101. Okay. Within the first seven to 12 seconds of any sales interaction you are involved in. Okay. And that, that is, like I said, it's all the way from if you sell door to door from the time they see you on the door, see, hear your first words to if you cold call on the phone to if you sell, like if you say you're talking to a boardroom, okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, of decision makers to you talking to uh, somebody in their home or on Zoom, inbound, outbound lead, it doesn't matter. Your prospects, we talk a lot about this, are picking up on your social cues. So they're picking up subconsciously, we can't even help it as a human being, You, your prospects are picking up on your verbal and nonverbal cues on okay. what you are saying and or asking that triggers their brain to react in one of two ways. Okay, that's what I mean by that. Now. How do they react? If you come across aggressive 
in the beginning of that conversation. And I'm not even saying like crazy aggressive. I'm just like commission breath aggressive. You've come across aggressive. If you come, can you give me an example of what that would sound like? Hey, hey, John, really excited for you uh, to to be on the the call today. Um, you know, I, I know what we have here to offer is is just you know I looked at your website and it's just going to be so amazing for I can't wait to jump in. Just something like that. That's okay, so that would sound pretty innocuous to most that's, salespeople. That's commission breath, just like that. Or, hey, John, uh, hey, did I catch you at a bad time? Hey, do you have two minutes I could talk to you about uh, what we do over here at XYZ? Just that. Saying, I, I, can you, do you have two minutes where we can just talk? First of all, your prospects don't believe that you're only going to take gonna two, minutes two minutes of your time. So you yeah, automatically yeah. have started to lose trust right there. So, Tibby, that's just, and I'll give you a bunch more examples. So, when we're coming across, aggressive when we're coming across, I, I would say, uh, assumptive, overly assumptive, yeah. and we're coming okay. across especially attached, It tr and we don't understand the right questions to ask, it triggers the human brain to go into what we call fight or flight mode. Now, if it's triggered where they go into fight mode, that's when you're like, hey, just get to the point, like, what's this going to cost me? That's fight mode, okay? Or, hey, I, hey, look, dude, I, I don't have time for this, like, just get to the point, uh, we're not interested. That's fight mode. Now, flight mode is like, oh, yeah, that sounds really good. But Matt, thanks so much for the call. I'm just really busy right now. We're really interested in this. But can you can you call me back a little bit later today? And then you call back and they never answer, right? That's flight mode. Mm. So we're triggering that by what we're saying and how we're saying it, like our tonality, our delivery. So it's sort of like you're you're being saddled with the weight of every conversation with every shitty salesperson they've ever spoken to. It just triggers them going into like, oh, oh salesperson, you know, like it, it's like it's like a it's like a it's it's the reptilian part of our brain. It just triggers like, oh my gosh, like we got to protect ourselves from the salesperson because we've had yeah. all these other salespeople in the past do the same thing. So when we say the same things, like I'm just following up. I'm just checking in. Th these are keywords that trigger that response in the human brain. Now, when we come across more neutral, and when I mean neutral, I mean more unbiased. Like We're not quite sure we can even help you because we don't know anything about their situation. How could we? When we come across more neutral, when we come across more collective, and we come across especially detach detach is the keyword okay yeah and we know the right questions to ask the right delivery it triggers the human brain to become curious enough where they actually want to engage with us they want to open up with us because we've triggered them to let their guard down we're disarming okay. the prospect see the difference you know what i mean by that i think i think the most uh i think one of the worst industries for this i'd say would be real estate I mean, there's that could be one, but there's I you know when I look at I every just, industry I, trend. I'm like, yeah, it's pretty much every industry. I, I think I think or like cars as well. I think it'd be a bad one. Um, but I think if I can, I think there's all, would you say there's another side to that as well, where like you can sort of um, is there the equivalent of sales resistance from a prospect? One of the things that I've seen is like like let's say you're uh, looking at houses and if you genuinely are in the market, you're pre-approved, everything is good, or you got the cash that's sitting there ready to go. I, I wouldn't, I don't run into a house and go, oh my God, this is perfect. This is where the kids are going to sleep. This is where the dog will do. Because I think if I'm a real buyer, I'm sort of going to keep my cards closer to my chest. But so why? Gonna, but why are you? That's the question. What because is, I don't want the salesperson mind. to have leverage over me. Exactly. Yeah. Because of all of that old shit you've dealt with every other salesperson trying to sell you something that all yeah. sounds the same. So you view the real estate agent, the same way you view everybody else yeah it's because they've never asked me a single question about me my current house what i'm looking for they just go hey this is a kitchen do you like kitchens yes i hey, do like kitchens. i love this kitchen let me tell you why matt i love this kitchen so much and you're like i don't care about kitchens i don't even cook <laughs> yeah <laughs> never even yeah, asked. they never ask a question it's always such a baffling thing you know i always thought it'd be really simple hey like why are you moving out of your current house what do you like yeah. about your current house is there anything you would change about your current house if you could Okay, perfect. Why that? Oh, okay, you think of expanding the family? Like, get an idea as to what they want and why they want it. And yeah, what's behind create. their why? Yeah, I, yeah it's I, such a strange I, thing, especially with I, something so emotional like a house. I, I sadly, I see that in pretty much every industry we train in, which is every industry yeah. on planet Earth now, but especially in that industry. True. So I never, I'd never thought of it that way. The fact that because I've never had a good encounter with a real estate agent that I think can actually sell. And if you are one, I apologize, I've never met you. 
Um, but like someone who who I've been invited into a home where I genuinely want to buy it or thinking about buying it, I've never been asked genuine questions. I've just been sort of, here's a pamphlet, show it around. And I know that like they want to get the highest price for the house. And so because I've never had a good interaction with that person, I've always like been very skeptical as I come in the door. And and that's, I guess, like the perfect personification of sales resistance. But yeah, let me suggest something to you. Now you're skeptical with real estate agents, but now because of that experience, you also associate somebody that sells a car to you the same way. Somebody that sells to you, let's say somebody walks into the Sydney office today and is trying to sell maintenance options or IT options. You start to view them the same way. You just bunch them in the same group, salesperson trying to sell me something because it's triggered from other experiences you have. So if we sound the same, right? We sound the same. Hey, uh, hey, John, I, I, I just can I just take two minutes of your time to, to talk about X, Y, C solutions and how we can help you save money? You just immediately resistance goes up, right? Yeah. So it really is that first interaction, that really, really first thing. They sort of, it's not that you need to not induce sales resistance. It's that you almost need to undo the yeah. natural bias towards you. Yeah. So you that's what every salesperson is competing with, just so everybody understands. So when you come into any sales conversation, it's called what we call an NEPQ status frame, right? We have all that in our virtual training platforms. So when you come into that conversation, you have to understand your prospect is already, they already have built in walls of resistance, right? Because yep. anytime we feel that someone is trying to sell us something, it doesn't matter if it's Aunt Mary trying to pitch her latest, greatest MLM to the car <laughs> salesperson to anything Anytime we feel somebody's trying to sell us, it's just, it's like a human reaction. The walls come yeah. up. So we have to understand this is what you're competing with. Okay. So when you come in, we have to, we have to understand the right questions to ask. Okay. And even the right wording to use and how to relanguage. And we'll give you some different word tracks to use in a second. We'll give you a couple of industry specifics. So you can kind of see in different industries. We can't give you every industry we're trained. Um, you have to come into that that conversation where they feel even in the first 30 seconds that you have at least the same status as they do. Okay. okay. What do I mean by that? That means that they look at you as like, Oh, this, this could be somebody could, that could help me. They don't know yet, but it's at least an even status. Now, as that conversation continues, that sales process, even if it's a one call close, two call close B2C or more of it's a B2B complex selling, you know, complex environment. And it's, you know, a six months sales cycle. Your status has to start raising in the prospect's mind, and that can only really happen by the skilled questions you understand how to ask and when and how to ask them that induces them to view your status in this subject matter as a much higher status than them. At that point, when they view your status up here, they view you as the expert, as the trusted authority who's going to get them the results they want. Now, what do most sales people do? They come in with this status, and even in the first 10, 15 seconds, a few things they say start to lower their status quickly. Hey, do you just have, uh, hey, the reason uh, on a cold call, hey, is this John? Hey, John, this is uh, Jane Kelly with XYZ Realty. Hey, John, hey, the reason why I called you was status starts to lower quickly, right? And so when the status lowers quickly in the first 10, 15, 20 seconds, now what are you having to do? You're having to now compete to bring your status at least back up to being even and then trying to get it up here. What we're trying to suggest to you guys is you don't have to have a lowered status in the first 30 seconds. If you change some of the languaging you're using, I'm not talking about cussing. I'm just talking about using the standard typical sales lingo that every industry uses. Okay. Like yeah. following up, checking in those type of things, lowers your status. Let me give you another one, Matt. How about this? I know you've, you're familiar with this one because of the industry you came from. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, really this call, Mary, is really to see, you know, on our end, if you're a good fit for what we do. I hate good, that one. The good fit frame. It's, I hate it's that. like, does, does your prospect, do you really honestly believe that your prospect believes in their mind that they can, if they whip out their credit card and they're like, it's 50 grand, here's my credit card. I want to buy now. You're like, sorry, you don't sorry Mary, you're not a good fit for the company. I have to reject that credit card. I'll tell you what that is. That comes from a couple of different things, from what I feel. I feel like it's, 
salespeople that don't have a great process, so they're they're searching for um, control, yeah, because they don't control the coal through a, a good process. Yeah, they're trying to posture. Uh, it's posturing, right? Yeah, and then from there, it gives them the ability at the end when they get objections to go. You know what? I don't think this is right for you. <laughs> and then they, <laughs> it's true. And then they have what's called an offers made metric. Oh, that's so which horrible. Is, which is what a lot of the coaching industry uses, which that if you're the... using it, it's pathetic. Uh, which is like, uh, you know, I, I spoke to 100 people of them. <laughs> I only offered 20. And of everyone I offered, I closed at 80%. It's like I, I have a 95. Yeah, and that's an in industry. I, I've seen, I've literally seen this type of frame used in, in pretty much every, almost every industry. There's a it's few. It's pretend. It's people who are pretending to control outcomes they can't control. Yeah, and I think a lot of that for me, like when I was taught to do that, it was like, no, you have to set the frame. You have to get the status. You have to do all this kind of stuff. And I was like, okay. And I found it to be immediately sales resistance, no matter how nice or friendly you tried to do it. It didn't work. But See, I think from, you yeah. come in at the same status instantly status is lowered. Now you're competing. You're down here. Now your yeah. prospect is, has sales resistance. You have to compete with that to get it back here. Keep yeah. going. And, and, and I think uh, like for me and a lot of the time in the coaching industry, that frame is followed by an action taker discount. Mm. Uh, you know, so hey, if you, if you, if you do decide to move forward today, we do have a discount for people who take action. And then from there, like if I'm ever on a call with that and someone says that to me, I'll go, okay. And at the end, I'll always go, I want to think about it. <laughs> they got the discount and then I'll go, okay, well, I'll tell you what, I'll call you back tomorrow and I'll see if you don't offer me the discount because <laughs> you know they will it's, but it's, the thing is if, if they do i won't buy yeah you know like, they because then that, that company has lied to me and yeah. you, you it's it's a straight up lie and so i we on, on our on our inner circle trainings a lot of the people ask us if we should do that and i go listen mate like you know sometimes you're just you're just painted with a brush because like you're painted into a corner because like that's the sales process in which you have to use as a sales rep. Now, listen, if you can manipulate that, I don't think it's best practice. But the first question I always ask, I go, is it true? And listen, if, if it is true, then by all means, make it work. But if it's not true, if that person will call back an hour later or the next day and still get the discount, then it's not real. And you're just lying to your prospect to try we, and build fake. We all know it's not true, right? So yeah. every prospect knows that if you literally call back six hours later, oh, no, the discount's not available. Very, I mean, it, people see right through that. So the, the point is, is when you put yourself in that position and Matt, you know, you know, they use that in that industry you came from a lot, but they use it in a tons of other industries. You'd be surprised that, you know, even some of the industries I came from, like if, you know, you're talking like high level B2B sales where you're closing million, $2 million, $5 million deals, they'll have some type of frame that's a little bit like, a, well, we have to make sure this is not only a good fit for you, but it has to be a good fit for us because our company just doesn't work with any client. Your prospects just don't buy that. They yeah. literally do not. Okay, when you say things like that, unless it's a lay down sale, I'm not saying nobody will buy it, but like yeah, yeah, ninety yeah. percent of your prospects don't believe that. So when you say something, they don't believe. What happens? Status starts lowering. They yeah. lose trust. That triggers more resistance, more objections. That's why you keep getting more objections in your sales process because you're triggering it even in the first minute or two of the call, even in the first ten seconds. That's why I always say. The sale is not won or lost at the end when you're trying to close them. Do you want the red one or the green one? Do you want delivery Monday or Tuesday? Like all those old school closing techniques. Yeah. That's not where the sale is made. It, it's actually funny. Me and you I actually have- from hello. I actually have even like, because like for me selling personally, because most of my high ticket selling mm -hmm. was selling sales coaching. For you, oh, back in the day, yeah, yeah, that's right. It was for you, right? So, um, <laughs> what three years, two, two. And a half. The sales resistance is at an all-time high when they come in because they're selling, they're buying sales training, and so like even some of the sort of uh, the um, the beginnings to sales calls that we teach, I wouldn't use because so like I have like so my calls open in the exact same way every time, which is, hey man, how can I help? Yeah. That's it. So I, I couldn't do anything because the sales resistance was so high when they came in 
that I couldn't even do like a, hey man, you know, so what we're gonna do today is this and this and this, and even like the most innocuous. Of, because they already knew a lot of our training because they could see yeah. some of our like, you know, free so, content that we give out. That's why like mine and yours training is, is sometimes slightly different. It's because most of my experience in high ticket, besides fitness, um, comes from selling sales training. And so sure. like, I, I'm always like, no, don't say a thing at the beginning. <laughs> just, just go, hey man, what's up? That's it. <laughs> that's it. That's my whole opener. So, um, but yeah, yeah it's, it's quite funny, but you know, um, different industries and require different things. And yeah. stuff like that. So, so it's funny, but it's the, like the, the, the thought process is the same, but the delivery can be different depending on yeah. uh, like what you're selling and who you're selling to, because that's that true. particular demographic is, is really, really like I'm being sold here. What's going on, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah. Salespeople for sure. So, Hey, so, so let me give you a couple of ways to relanguage a couple of things that we just, went yeah, on. let's be All fantastic. Right. So instead of saying I'm just following up. Now, like I said, this could be an email, could be in a text. How many, how many emails do you get, Matt, on a weekly basis from some Too vendor many. that says, I'm just following up or I'm checking back in? How many do you Too get? many. Do you ever even read them after that? No, no. <laughs> I never, I hear, I, I see the F word. I'm like, I, I can't take the cuss words. I'm out, right? And your yeah. prospects are the same way. They see, I'm just following up. I'm just checking in. It's pretty much over. So instead of saying that, just say, I just had time to get back to you. So instead of I'm just checking in or I'm just following up, hey, John, I just had time to get back to you. And then I might ask a question. I, I, hey, I just, John, I just had time to get back to you. I know a couple of weeks ago, you were looking at our proposal, but we didn't hear back from you. You know, where should we go from here? Question mark. But instead of saying following up or checking in, I just had time to get back to you. That implies that you're busy. You've got other clients. You don't need them. You're not chasing them down. You just had time to get back to them. So it's just a way to relanguage it. it. Means the same thing as following up or checking in, but it's not what anybody else is saying. Mm. See where I'm at on that? Yeah. Now, absolutely. Uh, what about the frame uh, to see if you're a good fit for a company? Let's relanguage that. So and now, this it's is going to depend. Been. This is going <laughs> to depend on what you sell because there are different tweaks for different industries. We, you know, according to Forbes, 158 industries. We train all 158 at this point. There's subsets of those. We're in all of those. Okay, so there's going the frames are going to be tweaked depending on the space. But let's. I'll just give you an example so everybody can kind of see it in action. That's industry specific. Let's say that you sell. Uh, let's say, I don't know, let's say you sell business consulting to companies to help them scale their businesses, right? We train a lot of people and that's a lot of companies in that space. So the frame after you initially, hey, just, you know, it looks like you booked on the calendar, blah, 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 if they're an inbound lead, then you want to frame it. Just say, yeah, I would say, John, the first part of this call, I mean, it's pretty basic. It's really more for us to, to find out more about kind of what you've been doing in the past to really scale the business, you know, kind of the results of that. Um, compared to where you're wanting to be. Okay, see the hand signals I'm using here? Compared yep. to where you're wanting to be, just so we can see what that gap looks like um, to make sure we can actually help. Because there's there's some companies where there's just not much we can do for them. You know what I mean by that? Now, I, I was curious. Mm -hmm. So like when you went through the ad where you saw X and Y and Z, what, and then going into that first connecting question. And the tonality of that's so important as well. Oh, it is. Because you know, let, me, let me do it with the wrong tonality. Yeah, John, the first part of this call is really more for us to see um, kind of, you know, what you're doing now for to, to scale the business compared to where you want to be to see what that gap looks like, just to see if, if we can actually help you. Because there's, you know, some companies that not much we can do for them. You, you know what I mean by that? See, that sounds mm -hmm. weird, too fast. In that conversation we had the other day, that's how I heard it. <laughs> yeah, it just slow. <laughs> yeah. Right? It really is. It's like, it's like that. Yeah, the, the, the tonality is almost just like very chilled, very laid back sort of finding the words. Yeah. The first think, part of this yeah. call, it's pretty basic. The reason why I say it's pretty basic is because I want to lower resistance. I want to let their guard down. I cut you off. Go ahead. No, no, no. I think um, the whole finding the words, when yeah. you have something you really want to get out and you really want the prospect to hear, yeah. if you spit it out, then it, like, it sounds pre-rehearsed. Sounds scripted. Really, it really lands terribly. And yeah. so if you do it in a way where you're um you're just trying to trying to find the words, you know, then like first of all, the person's forced to listen. Oh, yes, it there. draws them in. Right. Yeah. And and then and then it, it, it because you're just kind of like finding the words, it's obviously not scripted. It's 
it's off the top of your head. So this isn't like a foregone conclusion of a conversation. Yeah, because the moment they feel that your questions are scripted mm. is the moment that what starts to happen, they sales resistance. The sales resistance, right? That thing comes back in their head. They're used to all the telemarketing calls. Hey, John, the reason why I'm calling you is, and it's like they're reading off the script. So when you yeah. sound like that, that triggers that reaction. Does that make sense to everybody? It's triggering that fight or flight mode. But with what Matt said is spot on when you're, it's like you're finding the words, like you're searching, you're not quite, you're not sure what you're saying there. You're searching for the words. It pulls them in where it's like they're forced to, to listen and, and be curious about what you're about to say, because it doesn't sound rehearsed. And if it doesn't yeah. sound rehearsed, it doesn't sound like you're a salesperson trying to sell them something. When it sounds rehearsed, you sound like a salesperson trying to sell them something. Yeah, it's like when you're watching a play and it's a bad actor. It pulls you out of it immediately. <laughs> yeah, you, start, you start looking at the set and going, oh, look, this is a play instead of, you know, instead of doing it that way. Yeah. And I think like for like one of the one of the most one of the questions that I really lean on that when it, when it comes to our, our selling for here is our ideal criteria question. So, you know what I mean? Um, just so I can make sure that what we do would, would actually work for you. Um, what are you looking for in a training or a coaching program? Like what's your ideal, um, like what's your ideal criteria? Yeah. It forces them to think. And so I say it like that because it's like, I'm looking for the words. Now I know that back to back. Like yeah. I know exactly what I'm going to say. I know how I'm going to say it. And yeah. I can say it like, Hey man, just so I can make sure that what we would do would work for you. Like besides, you know, X, yeah, Y, and Z, what do you sure. actually look for in a training program? What's your ideal criteria? Yeah. And like, they know it's, they, it's so rehearsed yeah but they're not going to give me as as open of an answer than if they're going to say, say surface level. level oh i'm just yeah. looking for you know they just stay surface level so the the point being if, if you're if you're noticing in your sales conversations with whatever you guys sell if your prospects are staying surface level with you that's an instant thing that should go off in your mind i sound too scripted mm -hmm. it does it sounds rehearsed I'm not searching for the words. I don't have the right questions. That should be a red flag to you that you need to learn how to do that. Right. Yeah. So, so just, you know, we only got a couple more minutes here, but just stay away from verbiage. What's your goals? What's your goals, Mr. Prospect? Stop saying what everybody else is saying. No, mm. it's too generic. It's too big. So what are you looking for in a solution? too vague too generic so vagary so, we should actually do a whole podcast on okay. vague versus specific questioning because yeah. i actually feel that that is probably the number one reason why people don't make sales yeah because um, if, if it's vague that triggers what in the prospects mind uncertainty and you also get vague answers yeah you ask vague questions they give yeah. you vague and it makes answers. your calls much longer yeah it's actually the number one thing that I work on with our sales reps is yeah. asking very specific pointed questions based yeah. off what they've previously said. Yeah. Um, and that allows you to, to really kind of have a nice short, sharp. Remember when I first met you, you should, you should be able to sell anything in under 30 minutes. Yeah, exactly. So in, let's say, let's, let's even talk about sales training for a second. Okay. So instead of asking like a, like if you were talking with a sales rep and so saying, what are your goals this year? What the hell does that mean? That's so vague. Mm. Okay, walk me through specifically what, let's say that we come in, we teach you the advanced skills, work with human behavior, you know, everything to do A to Z, exactly what questions to ask, when to ask them, how to ask them, specifically, what do you really want to make in the next 12 months? That is far more specific than what are your financial goals in the next 12 months? Mm. Too vague. Yeah, and then when you get that, then you can go into solution awareness and you can go, okay, so before I started talking to me, what have you been doing Yeah. so that you can get the skills to ask those specific questions and get to $30,000 a month? And it's a very specific, so you're on this like really specific path and having a very, very like tight conversation instead of like having the whole. Yeah, like, that, that creates certainty mm, in the prospect's mind. That you're going to solve they, a specific they problem. They feel like, okay, this person, this company can take me here where I'm at now, my current state. Mm. They can take me where I want to be. And I am willing to even pay more for that to get that end result than I am with somebody else over here where I don't have that certainty. And, and that, that combined in every with a good, that combined with a good NEPQ presentation 
which is clear, concise, short, and ties back to the individual problems a person has. And it, how we it, solve those and what it creates means ultimate confidence in the product. Yeah. And that's in anything. Let's yeah. say you, you know, let's say you're a company that, that sells cybersecurity to large banks or companies. It's exactly the same thing as far as being so specific in your questions that allows them to get very specific in their answers. And even yeah. when you're clarifying and probing, you're not saying, what are you looking for in a solution? It's much more specific. Okay. So can you, okay, walk me through right now. Like if I'm a customer and X and Y and Z happens, what would happen? And you get very specific that triggers their brain to get very specific with that yeah. problem. But I think we could do a whole podcast on that. If you guys want to see that and you guys are watching this on YouTube, comment down below, comment specific, and we'll, and we'll, we'll make sure you put the time aside okay, to do okay. that. But where can they, where can the people find more information like yeah. this? Best place for everybody to start. You want to learn more about kind of the little nibbles me and matt give you guys here best place to start with us is go into our facebook group go to www.salesrevolution.pro you have a link here somewhere salesrevolution.pro mm -hmm. it's that simple right when you join check your your messages on facebook either myself matt somebody in our team they'll identify themselves hey i'm with jeremy and matt's team seventh level we'll send you over on your in your facebook messenger a free training called the NEPQ 101 mini course. There's a list of different questions and a structured breakdown that Matt himself will go through that's going to help you some more just from that. We go live in the Facebook group about three to four times a week, different trainings, different Q&As, just the little nibbles or d'oeuvres we give you there help you sell more. Now you yeah. want to start making, hey, let's say you're in your industry right now and you want to start making 10 grand a month in commissions or 15 or 20 or 25 grand a month in commissions or maybe you're already there and like how do i make 30 or 40 or 50 grand a month in commissions with what you sell right now because we can assure you we are training salespeople and companies that are making those type of commissions in your industry right now you want to learn those skills right there when you join the facebook group just dm us and we'll give you some training options where you can have those type of results and financial income as well matt thanks for being Perfect. on pleasure thanks everybody salesrevolution.pro we'll see you soon Hey guys, if you enjoy these, here's another you can watch right over here, right over here. Join our free sales revolution group. Click the link below, join us, and we're gonna help you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you real soon.